Hello everyone, in this video I'll be discussing the single photon avalanche diode, aka the SPAD. So in its most fundamental sense, a SPAD is simply a photodiode biased past its breakdown voltage into what we call the Geiger regime, such that even a single incident photon that generates an electron hole pair within the material will produce a large detectable electric pulse. So in this presentation I hope to convey the utility and impacts of ultra-sensitive single photon detection, emphasize the te technological underpinnings, review the history of the SPAD and the current state of the art, and then go into comparisons with similar technologies and future challenges and limitations to development. So being able to quickly and reliably detect single photons would be a powerful tool in many applications, and some popular applications and impact areas are listed below. So because of the high temporal resolution and hypersensitivity, SPADs enable precise distance measurement for LIDAR and time of flight 3D image formation, even in low light conditions, which could be very essential to future self-driving car technologies. SPADs have a critical role in quantum photonics as single photon detectors are key to both studying singular light quanta and to developing single photon communication schemes. In biophotonics, SPADs are used for time-correlated single photon counting in applications like fluorescence lifetime imaging microscopy, where they provide high temporal resolution to detect faint biological signals. In Raman spectroscopy, they can enhance the sensitivity to weak Raman signals enabling high-speed, low-light spectroscopy for material characterization and chemical analysis. So at this stage set, let's explore the technological basis for the SPAD. And we start with the PN junction. So when we join together a P-doped semiconductor with an N-doped semiconductor, we get a gradient in free charges that I would like to redistribute. Specifically in seeking equilibrium, XX electrons on the N side diffuse to the P side and excess holes on the P side diffuse to the N side. And this process continues until the left behind fixed ionized dopants, positive on the N side and negative on the P side, form an internal electric field that prevents further diffusion. And so this is our depletion region. So if we apply a forward bias uh, that is positive to P and negative to the N side, we work against this built-in field and encourage further diffusion current leading to an IV characteristic like this. And if we reverse bias on the other hand, we actually add to the internal field, further preventing diffusion. However, at finite temperatures, a small number of electron hole pairs may generate from breaking covalent bonds. And if it th this is in the depletion region, these generated pairs are swept away by the internal field. And this is the basis for the reverse bias saturation current. But something interesting happens if we keep adding to the reverse bias. So once we reach a critical threshold, we encounter a phenomenon called breakdown when current through the device diverges to an incredibly large value. Uh, more on this later. So now let's get into the basics of photodiodes. If a photon is incident on a semiconductor with energy greater than that of the band gap between the valence and conduction bands, it can exchange its energy with the crystal, knocking an electron into the conduction band and leaving a hole in the valence band via the photoelectric effect. And this is done in the depletion region where we have an intrinsic field. These carriers are swept away generating a photocurrent. Essentially, this works to shift our entire IV characteristic downward. So shining a light on a, on a diode produces an electrically detectable difference. And back to avalanche breakdown. So we've re we reverse bias the junction far enough. We build a strong enough electric field in the depletion region that can accelerate carriers to high enough energies to promote more carriers via impact ionization. These can then in turn generate more carriers, giving us a positive feedback cycle of increasing current in the junction. If the source of the initial electron hole pair is a pho photon, then we essentially amplify our photocurrent by a large enough factor that we can detect a spike. So this is the over idea, overall idea of the SPAD. If we bias the diode past the breakdown voltage with the help of supporting circuitry into a metastable state, then we can prime a device to generate a significant current spike from a single photon. So such a device can give us an output like the following, where a photon is absorbed, the current spikes, the circuitry quenches the circuit, the circuit back to its initial state, ready to absorb another photon. And these spikes are fast and thin in time, allowing for the potential for time stamping spikes, which, are, is conducive to, which is also conducive to a digital readout. Now let's get into some of the supporting circuitry. So the high current in SPAD can lead to damage if unaddressed. Therefore, we employ what is called a quenching circuit to stop the current from flowing after a spike and return the device to a condition which is ready in which it is ready to detect another photon. In passive quenching, we simply place a relatively high-valued resistor, 10 to 100 kilohomes, somewhere around there, in series with the diode. Here, a photon excites a high current, which then flows through the resistor, which develops a voltage drop 
that reduces the bias voltage to or below breakdown. While the, and while the rise time of the pulse can be very quick, the series resistance RQ, which is large, in order to quench the circuit, greatly increases the relaxation and reset time of the diode. Additionally, without any feedback, the passive quenching approach gives us little control over reset times and can produce inconsistent spikes if photon detection occurs at different excess voltages. So now that we have reviewed the fundamental components of the SPAD device, let's take a look at the key parameters dictating its performance to inform later discussions. So photon detection efficiency is essentially the combined probability of a photon both being absorbed and triggering an avalanche. Uh, the dark count rate is essentially a measure of the intrinsic noise sources of the, of the device. This is the rate of spikes triggered by non-photon sources, mainly thermally generated carriers or after pulsing, a concept we'll look at later. The dead time slash resolute time resolution of this pad dictates the minimum achievable time between detection events, limiting the frequency performance. And timing jitter refers to the uncertainty and delay between photons arrival and photon detection. So as indicated by the full width half maximum of an average detection spike. So now with the, the device function and key characteristics defined, let's take a detour through the historical development. So the theory of avalanche breakdown in diodes and the ideation of current multiplication de detection dates back all the way to research by Hates from the Shockley labs in the mid 1960s. But because of device limitations and practical, practical devices did not come around until much later. In the mid 1970s, Kova produced the idea or proposed the idea of active quenching to replace that support passive quenching circuits, marking a leap in possible device performance. And in the 1980s, with the grand development of fabrication processes, epitaxial fabrication of devices enabled price control, precise control over device parameters, enabling truly practical SPADs. And in 2003, contributions by Roshas and others developed the compatibility of SPADs with CMOS processing, enabling direct on chip integration with electronic components. And later developments such as 3D stacked uh, SPAD arrays continue to push the integration of SPAD units into high density arrays for future applications. So we'll spend time on two of the more critical app, uh, developments here, namely active quenching and CMOS compatibility. So avoid long reset and inconsistencies, we, inconsistencies with passive approaches and fully utilize the inherent SPAD characteristics. Active quench, quenching integrates active feedback and control logic components to sense the active avalanche pulse and react back to the SPAD by quickly, within nanoseconds, quenching and resetting the diode. This introduces a well-defined SPAD dead time, but also introduces a non-negligible de uh, detection delay. Therefore, in the variable load architectures, active and passive quenching are used in tandem to take advantage of the fast detection and passive architectures while ensuring quick resets and consistent results featured in active quenching circuits. And lastly, the idea of time gating emerged in applications where de uh, detections are expected in specific intervals. Essentially, this works as a time-based filter of unwanted signal noise. Uh, the gating structure ensures the device can only detect photons over a specific predefined gating window by quickly adjusting the diode bias. Second major development was the drive to make SPAD CMOS comp compatible. So custom epitaxial fab enabled unrivaled control over key device parameters and trade-offs, revealing the extremes of the potential SPAD performance. Uh, for example, a reach through SPAD al and allows for large active area, greatly increasing photon detection efficiency, but the expense of time consistency in speed due to avalanche path variations. On the other hand, uh, something like a planar SPAD enables high time resolution and array implementation at the expense of other parameters. So while these fully dedicated and flexible fabrication enable, uh, fully flexible fabrication enable the extremes of performance, um, the impossibility of direct integration with processing electronics can find their application. Making SPAD CMOS compatible locks you into the rigid fab, fab constraints of the CMOS processes, but enables the direct integration of SPADs with control electronics on chip, allowing for full capture of the developments and quenching and read, readout circuits. Further, SPAD tech could take advantage of the economies of scaling in CMOS processing, leading to the potential for high density, cheaper per pixel arrays. So now let's take a look at the state of the art today. So here I've written some of the best in class reported parameters, and I'll let you look through them. But the key point here is that balancing parameters is tricky. For example, while a jitter of only 7.8 picoseconds has been reported, these devices also had less than 10% photon detection probabilities. Or while researchers strive to decrease dead time, they simultaneously open themselves up to after pulsing and dark count noise. A good a compromise report here is a sub nanosecond dead time with a less than 0.14% after pulsing indi uh, probability, indi uh, indicating the potential for giga count per second operation. 
So spatter rays have continued to scale down and companies like Canon and Pi Imaging are commercializing incredibly high density SPAD based imagers for broad applications. Uh, Canon has a very cool video they put out about their latest 3.2 megapixel MS500. Uh, I'll put it in the description. They even show a, a captured video of a photon in flight. So let's take a look at the competing technologies. So a natural comparison of the SPAD is the avalanche photodiode, which also relies on avalanche gain for hypersensitivity, but is biased just below the breakdown voltage. While these can be self-quenching and feature linear ampl amplification rather than the SPAD's divergence spike, they're not suitable for single photon detection. On the right are two technologies that are. A superconducting nanowire single photon detector operates by using a thin superconducting wire cooled below its critical temperature, where the photon absorbs a single photon in where the absorption of a single photon rather induces a localized breakdown of superconductivity, creating a detectable resistive hotspot. These feature best in class parameters in detection efficiency, timing resolution, dark count rate, and can be operated across a wide spectral band. However, they are bulky, costly, and must be cryocooled to a few Kelvin. These are typically utilized in quantum research settings. A photomultiplier tube on the other hand works by converting photons into electrons via photocathode amplifying the signal through a series of dynodes via secondary electron emission and collecting the multiplied electrons at the anode to generate a measurable current. You can look through this table comparing various parameters, but the key point is this. The SPAD's simplicity, CMOS compatibility, and flexible implementation can enable wide-ranging applications ranging from research to commercial and sets it apart from these other technologies. So while the SPAD has come a long way, uh, let's take a look at the ongoing challenges and limitations. Number one, uh, power limitations. Of course, for single photon detection, power trade-off is reasonable, but there's simply no getting around the fact that you have to bias these diodes past the relatively high reverse bias breakdown voltage. There's just no getting around it. Intertwining trade-offs. As we've seen, optimizing one parameter comes at a heavy cost of others. Uh, improving all parameters simultaneously is difficult, and the rigidity of CMOS integrated fabrication may place limits on how far you can actually push specific applications, uh, sp push application specific trade offs. Dark counts and after pulsing can place an external limit on SPAD speeds. The predominant after pulse phenomenon is when a charge in a photon induced avalanche gets caught in a charge trap, often the consequence of crystal impurities. And these traps have lifetimes on the order of tens of nanoseconds, after which the released charge could trigger another avalanche. Even if developing SPADs have dead times on the order of, of a nanosecond, these internal noise sources could cap maximum tolerable operation speed. And lastly is scaling. Uh, if we want high density arrays, we, we may want smaller SPADs, but scaling down increase, introduces many difficulties. Reducing area further reduces what we call the fill factor of the array, that is the percentage of the surface area dedicated to receiving photons. The signal routing gets more complex, process variations across the wafer and across an increasing number of SPADs may become pronounced in some applications. And there's potential for crosstalk between SPAD units that can lead to increase noise and dark counts. Um, and you also need to keep up with the rapidly evolving and rigidly constrained CMOS processes. And that concludes my presentation on the single photon avalanche diode. Uh, here are some references that I use in creating these, these slides and for your own further reading. Thank you.